Good evening and welcome to the Economic Development Committee meeting for February 24, 2021. Tonight we have one item on our agenda. It's to hear bundle three of phase two of proposed changes to the Fitchburg Zoning Ordinance. Tonight in attendance, I have Councilors Sam Anthesqualia, Marisa Fleming, Marcus Di Natale, and myself, Andrew Van Hazinga. Councilor Bernie Schultz is not in attendance tonight. So we have a number of items to discuss tonight. We're gonna to be led by the Community Development Director, Mr. Tom Skorowski. Uh, we do have some uh, participants registered. Um, many of them are, uh, ex we would consider um, experts and members of the Community Development staff that we will call on or the Planning Board. We have the Chair, uh, Ms. Paula Karen here tonight. I will though pause at the beginning of each section to see if anybody has, um, Actually, probably we'll let Tom do an uh, introduction first. And I will let anybody who would like to submit some comment do so, and then we can go through any uh, proposed edits to the changes. So with that, I'll turn it over to Mr. Skrowski. Would you like to start the presentation? Great. Um, thank you, Councillor Van Hazing, and good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us again. I know it's been uh, quite a long journey, and we're nearing the finish line with with the zoning changes here. And I appreciate you all taking the time and members of the public um, to see what we're doing this evening. Um, just a very brief overview if this is new to anyone. You know, we've been working at this for over a year with a 20 plus member advisory committee. And it's been a two phase zoning process. The first phase was approved in August, was more administrative in nature, just making sure our ordinance was really buttoned up. And phase two, which we're in now, is really the transformative stage, looking at map changes, major use and dimensional changes. And we've had three bundles and one continued public hearing. Um, and just to review where we are, um, this committee has reviewed now both bundles one and bundle two. Bundle one has already been received at a city council public hearing. Um, bundle three is, of course, going to a committee this evening, and then from there we'll be looking at the full council public hearings for bundle two on March 2nd and for bundle three on March 16th. And then, of course, from there, everything's voted on and turned into a formal ordinance where it would go to the council for its readings. And I do want to note that aspect. I think it's important to consider as it goes to its readings. That's really where we're going to consolidate, format, clear up numbering and consistencies um, to turn it into a formal ordinance. So I, you know, we'll certainly try to cover everything we can to make sure that whatever we vote on tonight and ultimately on March 16th is the final ordinance. But you know, these will be votes of substance. Subsequent to that, we'll have time, you know, with the city solicitor and, and my team at the, the BSC group and, and the community development planning staff. Uh, and of course, uh, members of the planning board to make sure we're buttoning things up to make sure it's a, a good final ordinance that goes to its readings and reflects everything we've discussed of substance. So without further ado, I'll, I'll get right into bundle three and it is a number of items. I'll just kind of go through them section by section um, and give a brief overview and then actually go into the substance itself. Um, so first of all, um, I would also know if anyone does have any questions or anything along the way, it's hard for me to see um, as I'm doing the presentation. So, uh, Councillor Van Hasinga, please just let me know if, if there's anything that might come up. Um, so the right. multi- yes. in, in that in regard, I'll keep my eyes out, but please feel free to use the, the uh, chat function and I, I, will be, I will call on you if you have any questions. Thank you. Um, so the multifamily development section creates design guidelines and standards for multifamily development, um, development of four or more dwelling units. Um, it allows the planning board waivers for density and setback requirements. Um, previously, these things needed a variance, but um, provided it conforms with the special permit criteria of the board, uh, those waivers could be granted. Um, now, as many of you might recall, this was actually a piece of bundle two. Uh, and it was proposed in legislative affairs to table this because there was a concern that we were kind of painting with a broad brush, looking at any development of four or more units when, you know, maybe a four to eight unit development might look substantially different than a nine plus unit development where you might have a more sophisticated development 
pro forma and plan put together. Um, and for four to eight units, it, that might not always be the case. So uh, a question was made, could we better differentiate between the two? And so one new addition that you all will see tonight, um, and then we can jump right into it, is, is there, you know, previously, again, there's a planning board waiver for density and setback requirements. My proposed sort of compromise to the discussions at our last meeting was to allow that waiver only for nine or more units. Um, so, you know, basically what this would mean is if there is a, a, any development of four to eight units that doesn't meet the density and setback requirements, it would have to go to the ZBA for a variance. And basically in practice, that's how those type of developments have been governed up to today. Um, and it, it seemed maybe this could solve for, for some of the concerns that were mentioned. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and jump right into it now. Um, I'm pause my screen for a moment as I'm going to pull it up. And Councillor Van Hazinga, how would you like to um, handle each of the subsequent sections with, with given proposed revisions? Should I just start going through it, or how would you like to, to All address right, so Part of the complexity of handling this is that the planning board has already gone through and made changes, which are shown on this document. Um, we, we are hearing it tonight in the Economic Development Committee, but we will, the Legislative Affairs Committee will also be hearing these same sections following this meeting. So it's important to keep track of what changes are being made, what changes we're gonna be making, and also to try to be as consistent as possible between these two meetings. So, what I think, um, I have a number of changes or edits I'd like to propose um, on behalf of Councilor Zarella, who is on the Legislative Affairs meeting. Uh, we've gotten together earlier and discussed these and worked out what we think are some good edits to the document. And we wanted to present them to both committees to make sure that they're heard by both and we can hopefully come to a, a consistent conclusion. So I do have some edits. Um, I think, how do people feel? Should we go through the entire document before we make edits? Should we go through section by section? And I can put forward any edits that uh, Councilor Zarell and myself have come up with or that uh, anybody else has. I'd like to see uh, um, section by section. Agreed. Okay. Okay. So I think maybe, Tom, if you could just walk through each section of the, the document uh, as briefly as possible, and then we can address any questions or propose changes. Sure. And uh, just one thing to note is we're looking at the multifamily. Anything that shows track changes was a change recommended by the planning board, but anything that has a highlight associated with it was actually an addition proposed by the planning board chair subsequent to the meeting. Um, and, you know, I think the additions recommended by Chair Paula Karen certainly reflect the intent of the board's recommendations, but they weren't, they didn't come directly out of the meeting itself. I think that's worth noting, but most of the changes are somewhat semantic and just kind of better aligning with those recommendations. So, um, that being said, uh, we have the multifamily development definition which would be new construction, redevelopment, or building reuse um, on lots in common ownership that contain four or more dwelling units in one or more structures. And then it's proposed to adjust the principal use table accordingly, as opposed to multifamily housing, we changed it to multifamily development, and then um, governed its use by special permit of the planning board. Um, then our purpose statement. Think, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Tom, uh, just going back up to the definition. Um, yes. I have one proposed change uh, just in the wording of the definition to change uh, the section that says new construction, redevelopment, or building reuse to residential use or mixed use. I'll just put it in and then I can always accept or reject, but I feel like then at least you all could see it. All right, does anybody have any questions on that? That's just a, a clarification of language put forth by Councilor Zarella. Can you, can you say what the, what the change was again? I didn't hear it. Change sure, it. sure. Okay. So Tom just put it into the document and okay. it's also available on the left side of the split screen. 
Okay. Uh, with the extensive nature of many of these, um, I've written them out just to be as, as clear as possible. So it's just to refine the definition of multifamily development um, to be a, a residential use or mixed use on a lot. Okay. So it's really referring to the use. Okay. Then uh, uh, the construction of a building. Thank you. All right. Um, I'd entertain a motion to approve both this change and also the uh, planning board chair's um, inclusion of structures at the end of the definition. So moved. Second. So I have a motion and second. And I'll take this by unanimous consent unless there's any opposition. All right, it's unanimous. Um, one thing I would mention, this won't be the first time tonight where we go through principal use regulations. We're also going to look at the whole table later on. So I, it actually might be appropriate to look at it, the whole table within the context. So we're not kind of bouncing back and forth. Um, but again, the, this is pretty straightforward in that it's planning board in, in most districts uh, that would allow for dense housing. Um, and there's not really a change to vote on there. Um, then purpose statement, uh, and this really just lays out the purpose for the district or for this designation itself. It's not actually a district, but it just sets parameters for what multifamily development can look like in the city. I do have a proposed change um, put forward by Councilor Zarella to delete the first bullet of the purpose statement. Um, I think you'll see this in a, a number of the sections and the idea is to make um, the document as functional as possible and try to eliminate some of these sections where it's a little more um, chamber of commerce material, if, if that makes sense. Yep. It's a little more flowery descriptive language and it doesn't really point to what is allowed and what is not. Certainly makes sense to me. Yep, I'll uh, move that to for approval. All right, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, and I'll take this by unanimous consent unless there's any opposition. All right. Please proceed, Mrs. Skrowski. Sure. Um, the, then it lays out just procedures that, you know, this is actually an important one to know. Um, so it may be authorized upon the grant of a special permit and site plan approval by the planning board in accordance with the table of uses. Um, and it just basically states the information they need to provide uh, and they need to comply with all applicable requirements prescribed. Um, but that's pretty straightforward and kind of standard language for, for what we do. Um, and then it goes further to lay out the standards. Um, these standards shall apply to multifamily development in various forms. Um, so we have a bunch of different ways we can permit multifamily development in the city. It could be a 40R smart growth development. It could be what's called a PUD or a planned unit development. Um, it could be part of a multifamily development not otherwise defined. Uh, and what this is basically saying is, is all of these standards would apply across the board uh, unless there was a, a more rigorous standard elsewhere in the ordinance. Um, and then it, it lays out the criteria and starts with this statement that the minimum area for property to be eligible is the minimum lot size of the applicable zoning district as listed in the table of dimensional requirements. That's something we do in our plan unit development language. Um, but I could I pause there because I know that was one area that was meant to be stricken or voted to. Yep, so um, in consultation with Councilor Zarella, we worked out a revised section here regarding um, minimum lot area per, per dwelling unit. And if you look to the document to the left, it lays out the revised language. So what is being called for is to delete the first section, the minimum area for the property to, to get rid of that because it's a little duplicative. Um, and then really to split the, I think it's numbered four here on the screen into two sections. So the first sentence would be one item and then it would uh, form a new section starting with four multifamily development. 
And we did identify an issue with the idea to require at least 5,000 square feet for each dwelling unit. Um, we found that in looking at existing um, projects that have been permitted in the city, it's a much more restrictive um, area requirement than we presently have. And it also doesn't really um, work with other uses that are allowed. For instance, a up to a three family is allowed before it's considered a multifamily development. And that's allowed just in the minimum lot area. So for example, in an RC district, um, a minimum lot area is 7,500 square feet and you would be allowed three units. But if you wanted to develop a four unit property, which would be considered multifamily, you need 20,000 square feet. And that jump just doesn't really make sense. So we do have some revised language that's included to the left. And what it basically does is it builds off the idea that the minimum lot area starts with what would be required for a three unit property. So you can see that it would read for every dwelling unit above three units, there shall be an increase in minimum lot area over and above the minimum for that district equal to one third the minimum lot area for the district. In districts with no minimum lot area, a multifamily use under this section shall have a minimum lot area of 2,500 square feet per unit, including the first three units. So what this does is it makes that first item that we, we struck irrelevant because it's saying that the minimum lot area is the, the minimum lot area for that district. But it builds on, say, that you're allowed three units for that minimum lot area, because that's an alternative use that you could do. And then above that, you would need an equivalent lot area per, per unit. Does that make sense to everybody? I have a question. Sure, Councilor Squalia. Um, it, where um, um, is there a, a limit um, in the beginning or somewhere? Does it say that this is only four um, you know, units up to eight? Uh, or where is that kind of limit? Yes. So what will happen is if you look at the, the previous section that we instruct, there was a second sentence. That's going to form a new um, item following this. And you can see it to the left in the proposed changes. So there are some exceptions that we're proposing here that for larger multifamily developments that will require planning board approval, it gives them a little more flexibility to grant waivers um, if for the density if a more dense development is warranted and, so, and, um, and works with the surrounding neighborhood. Under that, the developer would have to go to the Board of Appeals. Um, there is an additional um, waiver. So in our zoning ordinance in the table of uses, residential uses on Main Street on the upper floors of buildings are per permitted by right. It doesn't require a special permit. And this allows the planning board to waive the density requirement for these properties. And this reflects that Main Street is a much more densely developed area of the city than other neighborhoods or even other parts of the downtown. And that there currently is no minimum area requirement in this, in this area, but it's also the most dense area we have. These are buildings that are, many of them are on very small lots, but in the and improve the lots you know almost completely so we don't want to have a or one thing we want to do as a city is to encourage redevelopment of some of these buildings that are being underutilized and we don't want to require a developer who's going to just put in a small number of units in the upper stories of a main street building to have to go to the board of appeals so this gives a little more flexibility for the that type of project just like we do to larger projects Thank you, I like it. And should I continue or should we, should we stop uh, there? For I think for this section, should we stop and just, um, does anyone want to put this forward as a motion? So moved. Approved. We have a motion. Second. Second. All right, and I'll take this by unanimous consent unless there's any opposition. All right. All right, thank you. Let's uh, let's move forward a little more. Right, um, and I am trying to make sense of of where this comment is coming through now. One one eighty one seven four three. All right, so that would that has to do oh, with okay. now it's labeled three. Right. Um, 
so this initial proposal refines the what is required for parking for a multifamily property. Um, and it really reflects that different apartments require a different amount of parking uh, based upon their design. If you have a one bedroom apartment, you're much more likely to require less parking in, in practice than you would say a three bedroom apartment. So right now the zone ordinance requires a blanket two spaces per unit. And this aims to give a little more flexibility to what is actually needed in practice by these types of properties. Um, I am proposing a change to this to eliminate the section that Tom has highlighted in the document um, to make this just blanket across the city. I think it'd be easier to just have it be uniform across the city rather than apply it to some districts versus other districts. Um, I think it's reasonable. Um, Councilor Squally, do you have another question? Um, I'm sorry, you want to eliminate the, the highlighted underlined uh, area? Uh, no, it, it's in gray. So right now, as proposed, this would only apply in certain districts, the RC, downtown business, FSU, NBD, and C districts, or no, it looks like C is struck. Um, but so then two units per, two spaces per unit would be acquired in all other areas of the city. And my feeling is it'll just make it consistent across the city. It gets very complicated to have it apply to some places, but not others. Um, and if, if I could actually piggyback on that a little bit too, the planning board, they were reviewing this and then they reviewed the off-street parking regulations right after that. Mm -hmm. When they reviewed the off-street parking regulations, they actually made the determination that across the board, it would be one for a one bedroom, one and a half or a two and anything over two bedrooms would be two spaces. So this actually aligns with the planning board's recommendations, even if it didn't come through in the document. Okay. Because this is what they took first and then subsequently they um, revised their thinking as, as the evening went on. Okay. Can I, I think, clear? Yes, I think Ms. Karen would like to talk. We did a, we don't think though, however, it was appropriate for like RA or RR or new subdivision development to then, um, we still, still think two cars per unit was appropriate. It was more for the denser locations to allow a reduction in the parking, not for every residential district in the city, you know, where there is adequate space. And so that was why it was two spaces in the parking table but then this provision was going to allow a different um, allotment of parking for special districts or multifamilies, particularly in districts. Well, okay, thank that was you. the thought behind yeah. that. So it was otherwise that you otherwise just recognize that by eliminating that and we're just changing the table to, to this piece of it, that it does it for everything between rural residential, new subdivisions, everything where parking you know, is a, can be an issue. Yes, so I, yes, I think parking and all that we haven't accommodated. Mm -hmm. and, and I understand what you're saying, but I do think it's simpler to have it consistent across the whole city. I think if you have a one bedroom apartment in one area of the city versus another area of the city, you still have the likely the same number of occupants. I understand that there may be some differences in density of the surrounding area or proximity to, say, a public parking garage or something like that. But I do think it makes it simpler. It makes sense to have it consistent across all zones in the city and to not have different parking requirements for different areas. Okay. That's fine. I just wanted to explain that was really the, some of the differences of, of why it was there. So it's just as why you recognize that that would do it for the entire city for all the res, any type of residential development. And, and so Paul, I, am, am I mischaracterizing it to say that the planning board? went across the board when it got to the table. I just, I didn't want to misconstrue. No, we didn't go across the board. It was, was that we were going to allow it for some special districts to reduce the parking, but it was going to be still retain it for um, like RR and RA and some other districts where the uh, two parking spaces would seem more appropriate um, for dwelling unit. And it was kind of to address the higher density um, okay. situations well, to be kind of like a relief, but I mean, whatever it is the council would like to change it to, um, we would do, but that was the rationale um, 
behind that. That's why it was like in the parking table about and see this section for other things. The other piece was, you know, it kind of makes look going by dwelling units of the one and a half and how you do um, on bedrooms, but it is challenging to count bedrooms. Um, when we look at the assessors, um, um, uh, not the map, but the uh, cards for each of the units along those lines, because bedrooms is kind of hard. And I think it is a challenge. I think um, in many instances where this would be a new development and a special permit would be required, that is one of the standard uh, pieces of information that has to be required is yes. the, uh, the breakdown of different unit types. All right, and we do have a question from our planner, uh, Mr. O'Hara. You asked, uh, would the parking waiver referred to in section three supersede the existing provision that the planning board can grant relief for parking requirements via special permit? Um, no, I don't think it would supersede that. I believe this would be the requirement that could be waived or reduced. Is that correct, Mr. Skrowski? That's how I've, I've read it, yes. So I think if we were to adopt this, we would have to make a corresponding change to the table of parking requirements. And that's something that would be a little more difficult to format having it apply to different zones of the city. Now, <clears throat> I'm wondering if, if perhaps Mike was referring to the statement here that planning board determines that the grant of such a waiver will not adversely affect. I'm, Yes, I'm exactly. wondering if, if it's worthwhile just putting a reference to the waiver section so it's clear that this waiver is connected to the planning board's statutory responsibilities pursuant. I think that yeah. might be what yeah. Mike's getting at. Yes, I, I think that's Fair a enough. good idea. Thank you for catching that. Yeah. So how do um, other members of the committee feel about whether or not we should apply it to just these districts or have it across the city or just this idea in general to fine tune the, the parking requirement? I have a question. Sure. Just clarifying uh, what the, the proposal that you're stating would do is allow developers to um, maybe build more units uh, or allow less parking spaces per dwelling unit in uh, residential, uh, in our new residential district uh, and uh, in the rural residential district. So right now, before we, we make a change, the, the zoning ordinance requires just a blanket, two parking spaces for every dwelling unit. This is whether or not it's a three family or a 50, uh, unit building. In practice, for larger multifamily properties, it is pretty rare for two spaces per unit to actually be developed. Um, we found at many properties that this level of parking simply isn't required because as you get larger, not everybody has two cars. And as you have a, a larger number of units, you're able to use a common number of spaces. And the planning board in the recent past has allowed for a reduction in parking in many large uh, or at some large uh, multifamily properties because a, a greater level of parking just simply isn't needed. Um, so the idea is to tailor the amount of parking that's required to the actual breakdown in size of the units because um, different size units are likely to have a different number of occupants. Um, a one bedroom unit is typically in the industry assumed to have 1.5 people. Um, so we can draw that you have between one and 1.5 cars, just, you know, as a, a rough thing. If you have, you know, a three bedroom apartment, you're more likely to have two drivers and two cars and possibly more if you have older children in, in the apartment who are driving or a roommate situation. So what this is intended to do is to just make everything a little more flexible and more reflective of what the actual need for parking is at these types of properties. So the question is whether or not to adopt 
this idea of being a little more specific in the requirement and where we should apply it. Okay, one more question. The uh, yeah. if I was to build a two bedroom house, um, uh, one and a half one and a half spaces is that one parking space or two spaces? So I, I use that just as an example of likely mean. number of occupants. Um, so this requirement will not apply to a two family house or a two I'm sorry or a two bedroom house. Mm -hmm. That would be a different line of the parking uh, the table of required. This would only apply to multifamily property. Okay. And it right. also does okay. not change anything for existing properties. Um, what it would only do would, would change the requirement for new development of multifamily properties. So what, what does everybody think we should do? I just I have a question. I just want to make sure I understood, I, I understood this. Sure. So your proposal is just to keep it to the districts that we're speaking about. Ms. Karen's suggestion is to broaden it to all the districts. Well, it, it'd be the opposite. So okay. this is what the planning board proposed here in writing. My proposal is to have it a blanket across the city, just be consistent across all the areas of the city. I would go along with blanketing it okay. only because I've, I've, I've had experiences with constituents where they have complained to me that there are certain sectors of the city that don't afford this kind of a, a, a latitude. And, and I have been told before how inequitable it is in terms of regardless of what district it is, it really depends on what the unit the development sizes or the or the or the or the, uh, the the residential sized units are one bedroom two bedroom three bedroom as to where the district is should be less relevant as is it a one two or three bedroom mm -hmm. so that's why i fall more on the line of blanketing this um for that reason alone okay thank you Councilor Dantelli. Yeah, I'm fine with this proposal. Um, um, I'll move um, that we strike uh, as you've suggested. Do I have a second? Second. All right, and unless there's any opposition, I'll take this by unanimous consent. All right, thank you very much. So we will say, uh, is everyone comfortable in making a corresponding change to the table of parking requirements as part of this? Okay. Yes. So, all right. So we'll, in court, we'll, Tom, if you could consider that to be a, a change there as well to be consistent with this. And, and I think the way we had left it um, was that whatever happened here would be mirrored. So I, I think the vote had been cast previously. Great. Continue. Uh, all right. Yep. When Go right ahead. Uh, it lays out a few more criteria, um, nothing that you hadn't seen or was proposed by the planning board. Um, so I could I could continue on uh, unless there's a need to pause there, and I can move to other uses. Yeah, I think go right ahead. Okay. Um, and then other uses basically just allows to. Um, have a mixed use project and, and mixed use would basically be defined as um, a non-residential use that's compatible with the residential uses and it's something that's already permitted in that district. Um, again, no changes there. Um, the, the last thing is design standards um, and this is really something that the planning board chair um, and, and the planning board generally would like to see in a multifamily development um, proposal because they they feel it's it's good to be transparent with developers as to what we would look for in multifamily developments. In many cases, a lot of what we see here mostly applies to larger developments, um, but it, it it's non-binding. It's really advisory, but it's it's good to kind of put our um, 
let developers know what we are expecting in larger developments because we often feel like we have, have to repeat these same things over and over with any large developer that comes in front of us. So green spaces, common spaces, bicycle storage, um, security measures, landscaping and the like. And I know there was a, a proposal. Uh, do you wanna get into this or, I mean, it was to remove this entirely. Yeah, so um, I do have a proposal set forward by Councillor Zarella to eliminate this section, to, to strike it. And it's not to um, delegitimize its importance, but just the feeling that this is something that is better in the uh, planning board rules and regulations. Um, personally, I could go either way. Um, I, I do see the argument to have it in, and I do see the argument that it's um, it's not really a restriction or a requirement. Um, there should be in the zoning ordinance. I, I don't know what does everyone else think, Councilor Squall? Yeah, yeah. I I I like this uh, design standard section. It's it's not necessarily binding, but as developers read the zoning, they they look they read this and they want to you know make this kind of proposal to the planning board with these certain design standards in mind and it also gives us um as the city kind of a placeholder uh in order to kind of uh expand upon these design standards uh, in the future i think right uh yes but i would caution that once something is in the zoning ordinance as we know are experiencing right now it's a lot more complicated to change. Um, for something like this to be in the planning board rules and regulations, it is something that it would be easier to update uh, to reflect current trends in development, uh, to refine different you know, changes in what the, the city would like to see. Uh, once it's in the zoning ordinance, it is a big process to, to change anything. And you know, one thing I would say is often what happens, we'll get a large developer, they'll come and give an informal review to the planning board, and then we'll say, hey, you need to have all of these things. And then they go back to the drawing board and they add those things. Um, and you know, they're generally willing to do everything we see here. And really, as a matter of course, number 13 is a requirement. Um, but it, it almost eliminates that extra step of having to tell them to do something if we feel like it's important. Yeah, that, that is true. It does make it more prominent, and it is common for developers to consult the zoning ordinance. Um, not all of them go to the planning board rules and regs, so it's something that we may not want hidden in that area. Um, Councilor Dinatelli. Well, I was thinking about what Tom was saying, and the process right now as a developer comes forward, may not know any of these design standard considerations, if you will, so they're not entirely prepared. Um, I don't know if it's fair to say that there have been instances where I've seen planning board meetings where a developer will be in, uh, will be required to come up with some of these considerations and they'll have to come back two or three more times with those uh, amended plans. So while I understand that codifying them in our zoning ordinance may be difficult to amend or extract, at the same time, transparency up front as to what the considerations will be, and it says consideration shall be, doesn't mean that they have to do it, they're considerations. I believe the planning board will identify in the crux of the meeting what number of considerations specific to that case they would like to see the developer have. And if the developer, whether he or she is prepared or not, I'm assuming they'll be prepared, they won't be blindsided or off guard with any of those considerations. They, they will see that this is the breadth of scope that they may be faced with, but on a case by case basis, the planning board will weed that down to a smaller number or require a larger number. I mean, I don't think there's harm in putting it in here, as long as it's in the ordinance to state that it's a consideration that may be presented depending upon the actual facts of the development as deemed by the planning board to be necessary. But to have, instead of just having them go in cold and then be thrown these considerations, at least we have some kind of upfront transparency that these are some general ideas of what you might expect depending on that specific case. So I'm not necessarily against keeping it in here. 
um, for that reason. As long as, I think it's less likely that we'd need to change something if we had it open-ended to say, it's not a, a firm requirement, it's just a consideration on a case-by-case -case basis that you may be asked to do these following things so that they're prepared or not blindsided. That's, so I wouldn't be against keeping it in here. Understanding that it would be easier to amend the planning regs. Maybe they amend the planning regs anyway, but to have it in here would be another source of information. Okay, that's very reasonable. Uh, Ms. Karen, would you like to uh, provide any comment? Thank you. That pretty much sums it up. The intent is like the, the rules and regs are pretty obscure. Nobody really goes to that for any type of criteria except a, how many plans to submit or, or fees structure for the most part. In some cases, it's kind of hidden, but the, the intention is to th put these up front for them to consider to incorporate. Um, into design, like we're, you know, very have some larger developments where you want to see electrical vehicle charging stations, we bring that up for some like here's 150 units and, oh, that's a great idea. It's like, well, <laughs> yeah, please incorporate, maybe, you know, incorporate a few into your design as you, you know, think appropriate, but that's the direction we're heading in, as well as what the, the city um, has adopted, like complete streets, um, safe routes to schools and other things like of that nature where, uh, We've adopted energy efficiency standards and things like that in order to, you know, keep keep our funding or we can get funding from the state for um, other provisions. So it could be helpful as a fallback uh, to point to that. This is some criteria that we are looking at. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Councilor Squalia. Yeah, um, I just uh, like to um, say I agree with everything Councilor Dina Talley said. Um, as a as a building designer uh, and building project designer for. Many years, uh, I can tell you, we go to the zoning, you know, we go to the zoning board uh, book and that's, you know, what we base our criteria up. We don't go to the planning board rules and regulations uh, generally. So having this list would give, you know, th this list would be given to, you know, the, the, the owner of the project to go, here's what the Fitchburg planning board is looking for. So let's try to incorporate as many of these design standards for their approval as we can. And it just makes it more transparent. So I'm I'm going to want to keep this in here. Okay. So it seems like the consensus is to leave it as proposed, and I have no problem with that. All right. And I did have one last comment. I do think um, it's a minor point, but we should make sure throughout this section of the ordinance that we're consistent in how we write multifamily, whether or not it has a hyphen in, in the middle and a capital F or perhaps it's just a small detail, but it's something we should catch before it, uh, it goes into the book. Understood. I'll, I'll opt for what's in the, the title and the use table, which is separated by a colon. And that's fine with me. And that, that's how I most typically see it in, uh, practice. All right, so I think that's everything for this section, unless anybody has anything else. All right, Mr. Skrowski, lead us to the next section. All righty, the next section is signage. Um, and this tweaks the signage regulations. Uh, importantly, it explicitly lays out permit requirements for applicant um, and enforcement capabilities of the building commissioner. Um, I'll go ahead and pull that up so we can review. This was an item that was, um, oh, I see. You guys didn't have that. I was, I was still paused. Uh, apologies. But this was an item that we were supposed to take on in bundle two as well, um, but not everyone received the materials ahead of time. So um, one moment as I pull this up. Okay, so um, a couple additions here in the general regulations 531. Um, there's an addition that clarifies that no sign shall be posted upon any tree, bridge, guidepost, or pole. Um, and it clarifies again that if you have something that's no longer sold, located, or carried on in the premise, it's a violation of the zoning ordinance and there are you know, enforcement actions pursuant to it. 
Um, and then larger signs or greater number of signs could be authorized by a special permit of the planning board. Um, all the rest of this is what's existing, what's in red were the new recommendations by the board. Um, and I, I see one proposed change here in 5316, um, which again, it replaced the words such relief, which shall not be detrimental with such relief and where such relief will not be detrimental. So um, basically where site conditions warrant such relief, which shall not be detrimental would become what I just stated. I will say I have a large number of changes proposed by Councillor Zarella. Um, and a lot of it has to do with the refinement of the language. Um, it's the, the lawyer and him coming forward and making sure everything is precise and accurate. Um, so I guess, do we want to take a vote on each of these? Or do we want to go through all these edits and we can take a vote or take out any at the end? How do are, people... are they? I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, Councillor. No, I'm sorry for interrupting you. I didn't. I didn't raise my hand. I oh no, no. Please consider this an open conversation. Uh, I'm, I'm. I'm reading. I mean, they they're largely textual in nature in terms of the substance. Mm -hmm. I didn't see anything glaring, so I wouldn't be opposed to blanket approving what he's proposing. We change from a textual perspective. Sure, and I can go through these proposed changes in the document on the left, uh, just to highlight um, yeah. any alterations that are more than just sort of changing of wording and things like that. Yeah, anything anything substantive to, to, to what we're discussing, okay. I mean, but, you know, if there's a the instead of an a or stuff like that, I, you know. All right. Yeah. I have a question, just, just to clarify the, the, sure. the, the pain on the left, those are the, uh, re many textual revisions by Councillor Zarella? Yes. Okay. So I think, Tom, first, do you want to go through the the major proposed changes? I'm, I'm sorry I interrupted you earlier, um, and just get an idea of that, and then we can go through the proposed edits. Okay, so unlike the last time, I'll, I'll just try to forge ahead, maybe not stop at each section, um, but sign permits, it's just, again, no sign shall be erected without a permit. Um, and then signs not requiring permits, it, it lists some of those signs. Um, there's also a few things that are accepted from what is constituted a sign, and we'll get to that at the end. Um, so most signs require permits, some don't, and then our ordinance definition considers some things not a sign at all, in short. Um, Has anything changed in that section? Um, in no, in, in only that the sign permit section clarifies that signs need a permit. But everything else remained the same until we get to 5335 window signs. Um, and here we added something about maximum area. Window size shall not cover any more than 50% of the window area of a window and shall be installed on the inside, not the outside. Um, and then there's a little bit of clarity regarding time. Um, anything, you know, which advertises products that um, have been, been removed within six days after the notice of a building commission uh, of the building commissioner are subject to enforcement actions. So if something's outdated, the building commissioner lets them know they have six days to rectify it. Otherwise, it's a zoning enforcement action and a fine, essentially. Uh, so I believe Ms. Karen has a comment on that section. Hi, Paula. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to oh, find oh. my unmute button, but it's not this. It's the uh, not. It's um five three five five. Oh, so, sorry. That one is okay. <laughs> no, okay. I'll, I'll come back to you then. I have a question on this section with the fifty percent mm -hmm. window area. Yes. Mm -hmm. Does this uh, also apply to um, signs that are like see-through that they would paste on like a storefront glass window that that you can kind of see through that you can see through from the inside, but maybe on the outside it's a little more opaque. Only, you know, because uh, some of the doors downtown would have, uh, you know, the 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 sign for the the establishment would be one of those 
half see through signage on the storefront, but this would uh, require only 50% of that. That's correct. Uh, we didn't get into the opacity, so it's really just about surface area coverage. And our, our current zoning, it doesn't address that uh, currently? Correct, and it's something that was brought up by a lot of folks on the ZBA in particular. Um, one thing, and you may have seen some of the downtown signage that states, you know, like this is Fitchburg, and it's more of like promotional materials that are there to, you know, cover up a vacant property, or if there's construction taking place, it's sort of an advisory notice. Those type of things are exempted from our definition um, of what a sign is, and we'll get to that um, at the end of one of the last items here. Um, and then temporary off-premise signs. Um, here we we had added standing signs, sandwich board announcement signs, um, and just clarifies that they shall no sign shall be located on publicly owned land, sidewalks, or traveled ways unless a license is granted by the DPW commissioner, and it doesn't impede accessibility, and they need to be removed and not left on public land overnight. And then we have um, signs for residential uses and signs for non-residential uses and basically just lay out what's permitted. We decided to go for use rather than district because it's, it's really more appropriate um, to consider, you know, a, a home or, or a residential, um, you know, use has different types of signs than uh, commercial use. And it's really about the use itself, not the district. Um, although most residential districts would have primarily 181534 residential uses. Um, and some minor changes here, adding downtown business district. A temporary sign permit must be obtained if a pennant banner or feather flag is to be displayed for more than 60 days. And then it lists out the following um, signs that are prohibited in all districts, um, abandoned signs, flashing signs, temporary signs with digital components, signs with flames, um, and, and so forth, and then lays out that signs can't be attached to other things um, like trees, dumpsters, publicly owned land. Um, lays out signs for marijuana that's unchanged, maintenance of signs is unchanged. And then here we get to the definition um, and we added here, the planning board did letter uh, L, I believe it is, that interior window coverings not directing public attention to a service event or use that's intended to block public view to a vacant space or space under construction. So this is the whole definition of a sign and basically lays out what is and isn't included in this ordinance. And you know, in short, what it says is everything, everything A through I, I'm sorry, not L, but A through I, all of those things are not governed by this ordinance. They're, they're exempted. And all of them, except for I, we have currently have in our ordinance. We just added that one. So I, I might be a, um, like a, a window shade that doesn't have text on it that one uh, might consider signing. Correct, or the this is Fitchburg signage that you might see downtown right now, or it, you know you you often see the the brown covering, like almost like the paper covering when construction is taking place. And that's it um, in terms of the planning board's recommendations. All right, so getting back to the proposed edits in the document on the left. The vast majority of them are just changes in wording or formatting. Um, if you look at point number three, this is a clarification that basically grants an exemption for small signs on a, a residence that 
say have uh, already in the definition, the address number is exempted. But say if someone had their family name or something like that on the side of the house, this would be exempt. It's quite reasonable. The other exemption below that is um, basically designed for to exclude a, um, a small plaque, like sometimes the historical society has for historic buildings in the city or very old houses. Um, we didn't. We wouldn't want to require a permit for that kind of small, unobtrusive sign that just adds to the character and is informational in nature, and it's not an advertisement. That's all that is. Um, the rest of them are just clarifications for the most part. Um, if you go to item number thirteen on the second page, Tom. Um. I almost would mention 5336 in no okay. case shall a permanent or semi-permanent sign advertising student housing rooms for rent or similar be included in this exemption. Um, I, that feels like some okay. substance there. I don't know. Yeah, so what that is, is that's really not a sign associated with identifying the um, a residence that is more of an advertisement or a, a commercial sign on a residential property. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So those kinds of signs would be allowed, but they would just require a sign permit like other business signs. Because this says real estate signage is exempt, this section. So this basically says that's not. Correct. And the real estate signs are the temporary for sale signs that are out front right. of the property. Right. That they're okay. not I just wanted to clarify that. Great. Any other questions on this page before we go to the second one? And I will uh, say uh, our planner, Mr. O'Hara, did uh, point out that the Fitchburg Historic Commission can supply the old historic building markers. And they're about 11 inches by 16 inches uh, for historic properties that you see sometimes on older houses or buildings downtown. Where I, is it? I, what's that? Is that noted here? Um, no, that's just in the comments, but that is in reference to item number three, the, the second part that that type of sign would be exempt. So if someone has a historic property and just wants an identifying marker supplied by the Historic Commission or Historical Society, they wouldn't need to get a permit, but that's an acceptable sign that we could just accept that we don't need a permit for. All right, if we go to the second page of the proposed changes, I can direct you to item number 13. This is a new section that's being inserted that was um, developed by Council Zavella for, um, in consultation with the building commissioner. And this really allows for directional signage um, that at a, you know, the entrance to a site or a vehicular access point. Um, and it limits the numbers and what can be included on this, but it does reflect that there, this may not be a advertisement on the side of a building, but it's really directional and directs cars how to enter the site and um, how to navigate within the site. Five, three, five, six. Five, three, what, what, what change is that? Five, three, Sorry, five. I'm Councillor Squally. I'm following it here, but I'll, I'll bring it down as well. It would be an addition. So we have five three five five and then it would be in addition to the ordinance it would be right here before prohibited signs in all districts oh, okay so if you if you see here would be would be the addition as highlighted on the left hand side and if you look at item number 14 in the proposed edits this would add a definition of directional sign to the definition section of the ordinance and I think just to depart for a second, I did, <laughs> Ms. Karen had a comment on 181.5355 that we never got back to. Uh, Ms. Karen, do you wanna bring that up now? Sure, thank you. It's about the banner pieces. Um, let's see, I think it was D. It has to do with the size and quantity. And there was a suggested change to the language. 
but I don't know that there, the suggested change captures what the intent was. Um, yeah. Read the entire third sentence, that one? Uh, well, go, if you put, um, can you scroll to the, the um, Council Zarellis suggestion language on the left? Yep. So that would be item number 10 on the document. Item 10, yes, item 10, okay. right. And that would co correspond with D just to the change. Okay. Because it was replaced with the following, but it presently reads, it's like um, the second sentence, no more than one pennant banner or feather flag may dis be displayed at any one time along or facing each street fronting abutting the parcel of land on which the establishment is located. Provided, however, the multiple banners, pennants, or flags may be displayed for each 50 feet of street frontage under single ownership. That was to accommodate um, plazas, particularly, that have more than one business in them. And I don't know that to allow one, one for every 50 feet of frontage so they could do multiple ones. I'm not sure the suggested language just looks like it bans all of them on frontage, like you're not even allowed. So it, I, I'm just, unless I'm interpreting it not correctly, because this one, it starts with no more than one pennant jump at any one time. However, if you have more than 50 feet, you could do more than one. Okay, so I believe the proposed change in item number 10 on the left is for section one that starts temporary banners and pennants can only be located on the site of the business or property. So it leaves the previous um, item size and quantity alone. It doesn't change that. Oh, it's the one above it, number nine. Oh, yeah. number nine, okay. Nine, <laughs> nine, nine. Nope. Yep. Uh, highlighted nine. here <laughs> Okay. and here. It All says right. this so note can be displayed at any one time. So I'm like, well, that means none? No pennant or banner for that. So it's oh. basically, I think his thought is to replace the second sentence. So, um, oh, oh, I see your point. Right. Yeah. See the point? Okay. No more than mm -hmm. one can yep. be displayed at any one time unless you have more than 50 feet of frontage. This cousin yes. is what it could be now, but I don't know what it's, the intention by taking out the not more than one also takes out the well, even allowed one. Let me just try to hard to interpret. No, I, I, that does appear to be just a, a a typo to exclude that. So I would um, recommend that we alter, we edit the proposed edits to the proposed edits to the zoning ordinance, um, just to include. So no it's, as one. written, it's no pennant or banner. And you're right, it should be not more than one pennant. Then, and then the second half is is still, still allowing more for additional frontage. So this would, this look like the intention is to just restrict it to one. So what it is, is, um, so this is only to replace the second sentence, the no more than one banner. Uh, and it's still, um, so it'd be one banner for 50 feet of frontage, which I believe is the same intent as, as written. Any one 50 foot length or less of street frontage, not more than mm -hmm. For less. each 50 foot, each it seems, like it's clear that you can have more than one? I think as initially proposed, so it's restricted to not more than any one time. Um, but as so as written, it's multiple banners, pendants, or feather flags may be displayed for each 50 feet. Right. That's a little unclear is how many multiple per 50 feet. So it, it, I think the intent is to clarify. So it'd be one per 50 feet of frontage. Right. We're correct. This, we're trying to trying to um, explain this. It's one per 50 feet. Yes. For parcels I, I that are under one owner. So it's kind of like for those that have those multi businesses that they want to either rotate or have be able to put out something for each of those businesses, they could do that. A business could take a permit out. Mm -hmm. And they wouldn't be all congested, but yes. So and I and I think the just with the correct wording got us out from um, Councilor Zarella that we should edit it to no more than one. So I think I believe I may have said not more than one earlier. No more than feet. any one time along or facing any one fifty foot length or less. Can there be a clarifying that says? 
you know, you can have one tenant for each 50 foot length. Like yes. Yeah, so what this is saying one? as proposed is that um, you can't have more than one tenant for each 50 feet. For any one 50 foot length. Yes. So if you have a, a shopping plaza that's 200 feet long, you can have one pendant every 50 feet. Well, sometimes that doesn't work either because you only have like an island. <laughs> yeah, it, and, and, it, and it may so not work like for every like... circumstance. But right. what it avoids is sometimes you have just the row of, you know, 15 pendants or those feather flags in a row and it, it's just blocking the view of everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. At least that's a compromise. I just, we're just trying to make that clear to make sure we don't eliminate it and we, we allow for multiple ones for those um, types of businesses that want to put something out there once in a while. Yes, I, I believe that is the intent. So it says the establishment, but what if it's a plaza where there are multiple establishments? So it would, in, in terms, um, I'm sorry, where do you see? So uh, I, 50 oh. foot length or less of street footage abutting the parcel of land on which the establishment is located. What if so there, I, what if it's like I, Park and Plaza? So I believe the establishment would be in reference to the, the whole property, not individual tenants. So it looks like if we made that one change, it would be identical to what exists today. So I'm I'm wondering if maybe we're missing the intent of the counselor's ordinance and if it might be appropriate for him to propose the amendment in legislative affairs. You know, you, you are right now that I'm looking back and forth. They, uh, yeah, um, sure. So would anybody oppose to leave this out and then we can address this in the next committee hearing and, and he can uh, explain it further? All right. Okay. So then back down to the bottom, um, prohibited signs in all districts. Um, and this, I don't know if you have any commentary on this change here. It, it, it seems verbiage in my view. Yes, I, I believe the, the intent is just to clarify the format and some of the verbiage, but it's if you compare, it's a lot of the same things that are. Um, right, instead perfect. of letters, it's five, three, six, seven, six, eight, et cetera. And the only other thing is at the end, there are some sort of questions. We don't have specific edits to, to put in, um, but in Council Zarella can probably discuss these more in the legislative affairs meeting, but I just, just did want to bring up, there is the issue of how to treat um, political signs um, because there is a requirement that the regulations are content neutral, that you can't treat signs for one item or purpose different than for a different purpose, a sign is a sign. So we may have to give some further thought and this will probably involve legal about how to clarify um, how political, temporary political signs are treated and regulated. And I think the, the fix would just be to add an exception for it in the definition. And I mean, we could even, well, we could certainly have that ready for the public hearing, even if it, the committee had given that direction that we, if they felt like that was something we wanted to make sure was exempted from this ordinance, which I think everyone would likely agree to. Mm -hmm. I have a question on that. Um, in our existing ordinance, it says something like, you know, um, all any political sign on any residential property is exempt from this zoning. Um, mm -hmm. Is that that text right there you're saying is not content neutral and therefore might might be an issue? That is the concern that has been raised. 
Um, I'm not in a position to make a statement of whether or not that is true. I, I simply don't know enough about the issue. But I think Councilor Zarella raised it as an issue. We should give a little more attention to make sure that we are uh, following, you know, appropriate case law and regulations. Okay. Um, I have a couple of other general questions. Sure. Um, so, um, uh, Mary Jo Bohart. And uh, Paula Karen brought up issues in the chat. Um, will this will these signs apply to the planters downtown? And will this uh, is there anything in the regulation a lot that allows or disallows general open or closed signs? I, I I don't I don't think that would be considered a sign. We could certainly make an exception. Um, well, it's a flag. There's flags too. Right. I didn't see anywhere really that brought that up. Oh well, open flags I would I would think would be considered under what we had just discussed with the the signage or the the penance per fifty feet of frontage in that previous discussion. That's a little different, though, than an open flag, because each business may have one of those which, where the feather flags and things are out by the street versus right. like being at the doorway or in a sign window. It's a good question. I don't know. What do you? And, and the downtown, the planters, you know, like um, it, um, there, you know, there's a plaque on each planter and that um, goes to, you know, promote you know the play for the flowers to the rotary and and also the knights of columbus has the planters with placards on them is there anything in this ordinance that allows or disallows those specific signs so i i think that i mean currently we have it it's not in our ordinance today um prohibiting it or allowing for it with an exception um so it's been happening in practice. If we wanted to codify it, I would just recommend adding it to the definition exceptions here. Definition of ex exception, e exemptions? Exactly. Okay. So an exemption for like open signs and um, maybe uh, bench, bench signs, planter signs, things to promote charitable. I don't, I don't know what wording. But maybe we can come up with something. I think that makes sense, and I, but I do think we have to be deliberate and con, uh, considerate to the specific language we use to define those things. I think conceptually, I don't have any problem excluding those things. Uh, a reasonable open sign hanging by a door is no problem, and it goes in at the end of the night when the door closes. Um, no problem with the signs on the planters. Um, they're generally smaller and unobtrusive. Um, I just think we have to be mindful of how we just, you know, craft the language, but I, I think that's reasonable. Yeah, I just want to make sure that whatever we're proposing is not going to disallow that or require permits. Mm -hmm. um, I also have another um, question about 181.5337. Um, I don't know if anything has changed uh, in this particular section, but um, for temporary off-premise signs, um, it says um, such signs shall not exceed six in number per promoted event, including any signs that may be placed on premises. So, for example, uh, like the Greek festival might put, um, you know, a couple of signs at their, the Greek church. They might put, you know, 20 signs across the city. Um, would that be, is that not allowed? Um, because it's, you know, if they put two at the church, would they only allow, be allowed to put four within the entire extents of the city? Could you repeat the question? So uh, 181.5337, temporary right. off-premise signs. So there's an area that says, such signs shall not exceed six in number per promoted event including any signs that may be placed on premises. So like, you know, Civic Days, Long's Joe, Greek Festival, St. Anthony's Festival, all these things, um, 
uh, are, are they limited to six total signs inside the city limits? Is that what this means? That's, that's what we have today. So we didn't propose any changes. That's what, what exists. I mean, is this practical and realistic? Maybe this is something. Um, I think that is a, a good point that the number of signs that would be appropriate is heavily dependent on the size and scope of the event. Um, when you have something like Civic Days, which includes most of Main Street, you, you may need more signs. Um, so I guess, do we define it in a number or how do we, how do we approach that? I would, I would propose that we strike that sentence. Um, it, I mean, what would be the problem with striking that sentence? That, you know, the city would be, there would, there would be too many signs. That doesn't seem practical that that would happen. But six is, in practice, uh, far too limiting um, to be followed. Wait, you, I could suggest to you, you could add, a statement providing, well, actually, the building commissioner might not appreciate this, but offering some discretion given the circumstance as they're, you know, these events require a permit. So, pursuant to that permit, the building commissioner could place conditions regarding the number. Yeah, I think, uh, Ms. Bohard, you had a comment? Temporary promotional yes. signs yes. for annual events may need to be at each of our gateways, which could be more than just six. Of them. Yeah, and I think that's a fair comment. Um, large events you want to you want to publicize, so um, I think I don't have a problem with removing the limit to six. I don't know how well that's enforced in practice. Um, Ms. Karen yeah. also made a comment of recommended maybe. Uh, one month would be more appropriate than 14 days. That was going to be my second concern. 14 days is is pretty short in span of um, trying to capture people's attention, especially for some events. Um, you know, I feel like 30 days is more appropriate. And then also removed within three days. Maybe it was maybe if it was three business days after the event, that would be more reasonable. I'm just going to put all these changes in. And again, even at the end, the last statement does offer the building commissioner discretion because it's subject to his finding that the signs will not be detrimental or injurious to the neighborhood. So ostensibly 100 signs would be in most cases, right? So this, it allows for judgment though, as opposed to an arbitrary number. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair. Does anybody have any opposition? Okay. Um, do you have anything else, Councilor Scalia? That's that's it. All right. I do notice one comment from Ms. Karen uh, a little while back, uh, where she was asking, should there be a general lawn sign size allowed in residential and non-residential uses? That do with these temporary signs should we limit the size of them? Can they be big or they have to be standard sort of pendant size? What do people think? Um, that would get into the the political, uh, limiting political signs um, and, and then that would likely be a problem. Yeah, I wouldn't want to touch that. Okay, we can leave that then. That was the attempt of trying to uh, solve that rather than trying not to identify it's a political sign, just any lawn sign trying to be neutral. What you would do so you're not identifying it as political mm -hmm. that's just a just a thought <laughs> i'm sure the attorney's got other, other ideas that could um, have some better language yep um and I, th I think to that concern about the political signs I, I think we do call out here specifically the retail for sale signs or the, or the you know the real estate for sale signs as you know temporary signs are allowed and i think it seems like the political signs are a, a similar nature they're typically similar in form and they're also temporary they come and go um so i think i think we should be able to work something out to to make this compliant um all right so does anybody else have any other proposed changes so what i would propose is that we um i would entertain a motion to 
amend the proposed changes as proposed, which would include the changes we just discussed put forth by Councilor Squalia, and also all of the changes on the left with the exception of number nine, which we'll leave out for now and allow for discussion in the legislative affairs meeting. I'll move. I'll move. All right, and is there any opposition? All right, we'll take this by unanimous consent. All right, what's next? Okay, so next up, we have earth removal. Um, and this sets special conditions for the commercial removal of earth, sand, gravel, soil, et cetera. Um, this is currently allowed by special permit in certain districts, but this provides additional parameters and guardrails for this activity. Um, this actually was proposed by the board chair um, utilizing an example from uh, Milford and a number of changes were then proposed based off of it. One of the things I would just note is this uh, amendment is not formatted in any way, shape or form corresponding with our ordinance. Were this to pass in concept, we'd make that change. So it most importantly, it defines the removal of earth products from a lot, including but not limited to sand, gravel, soil, loam, et cetera. And basically says the removal of earth products, which is incidental to and in connection with necessary excavation and grading of a site for a building or structure and its appurtenant driveways or parking facilities for which a permit's been granted by the building commissioner. If such removal doesn't exceed 150% of the volume of the first floor, or construction of a street approved under, under the subdivision control law shall not be considered earth removal. So landscaping for your homes, not earth removal. Standard construction activities for building are not considered earth removal. This is when people are taking a considerable amount of earth away from a site uh, for commercial purposes primarily or for grading purposes um, of significance. So I'll just kind of pause there. I, it then goes further to request a, a permit from the Board of Appeals and then lists out a series of conditions um, for, for what this earth removal could look like. The one addition that was recommended by the planning board is that earth removal activities conducted in the water resource protection overlay shall comply with those additional requirements. And similarly, um, they need to comply with the stormwater management code. These are just guidance for developers that would be doing this activity. Those are already requirements per se. Um, and that those were the recommendations of the planning board. So I'll really pause there and this could be an opportunity if people have additional comments to make. Right, right now, um, nothing exists within the zoning for um, earth, earth removal. It's just, uh, what, is, what, what, what exists right now? Nothing is allowed? Um, it's allowed, so we could certainly take a look at the ordinance itself. Um, it's allowed by special permit in select districts. Um, and, and the definition, um, well, so it's, it's basically across the board special permit, not allowed in the FSU district. And the definition itself, uh, the removal or relocation of materials such as topsoil, sand, et cetera. So it's, it's very um, broad as opposed to the new one's definition would be quite more specific. Would this new um, proposal be uh, uh, across all districts? It would be, it would, it would set standards for what would take place across all districts. There is a proposal in a dimensional in the um, table of principal uses to look at that to see whether or not the uh, council would want to restrict it to certain districts. Right, and we could certainly get to it when we have that discussion later, um, but it, this would pertain to any earth removal operation that qualifies under this definition in any district that's looking to get permitted. It also does not change. This is the current definition in italics there. That's just there for um, uh, reference of the, the definition. That's the present definition. So it's not changing the trigger. It's just uh, providing criteria for the special permit to help clarify. 
is there well, anything um, um, if you were to remove, uh, I, you know, there's um, slope requirements. Is there anything that specifically defines retaining wall requirements? Or is that a not in this section? So we can certainly get to um, get to that uh, when we get to the recommendations by Councillor Zarella. Um, one of the requirements of a special permit is that they receive departmental review, which would include DPW engineering and all the other DPW boards and uh, or divisions, and they would provide their feedback accordingly. Um, but one of the things that Councilor Zarella had proposed is that this get undergoes further review by DPW um, to add any conditions as they see appropriate. And I believe there is a section that does um, deal with the restoration of the the land following the completion of the earth removal activities. And I believe the proposed ordinance does lay out the um, a maximum slope. Um, I forget exactly, I, I wanna say it is. One foot vertical rise to one and one half correct. horizontal distance. Yes, and I can get into it more when we go through Council Zarella's proposed changes. But one of the things he proposes is just to expand that a little bit to add a statement that is actually from the um, purpose statement um, that the land, when it's restored, it should be to reasonable condition for the uses allowed in the zoning district in which land is located. So that, by you know, definition, when you are removing earth, you're changing the 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 what the physical characteristics of the land, and when you're done, you have to make sure that it's a reasonable, usable land um, or, or format when you're done that you can't leave it you know just scoop scoop out at the side of a hill and then leave a cliff that you have to grade things down and make sure it's usable if it's a residential area that you could develop houses on it or, or so forth hey, did um, you say this does not apply to driveways like personal Home driveways. So one of the intents for this is to different, differentiate between earth removal as an enterprise or sort of the primary use of an, uh, an area mm -hmm. and then earth removal, which is incidental, which is part of something else, whether it's building a house, putting in a driveway, putting in a road or things like that, because the goal is not the earth removal in that circumstance. The goal is to get a driveway or to have a subdivision Okay. or to have a, a Traded basin or something like that, which may require earth removal, but that's not the intent of the operation. Earth removal is you're taking sand or gravel out and using it for a different use on a different site. Okay. Um, now, on the left, Tom has brought up the proposed changes put forward by uh, Councilor Zarella. Um, many of them are insubstantial, just changing in wording and things. He did recommend that the special permit granting authority be changed from the Board of Appeals to the Planning Board. Uh, and just that this involves site plan review and things that the Planning Board is a little more experienced and typically works with that Board of Appeals doesn't typically handle. So it's just it may be the better equipped board uh, to hear this, this type of item. And I think the, the Planning Board had proposed ZBA, understanding that Councilor Zarella and others on the council might tip in the other direction if they didn't see appropriate. I think they they generally seem fine with either approach. And I did see a note uh, from Ms. Karen that uh, she's fine with um, changing the planning board. Do you want to go through these proposed changes in detail? Um, or are we are we good? I, I think everyone can take a look at them. It's just you know changing wording here and there. Um, one change would be that the the proposed ordinance includes uh, setting a performance bond to guarantee the reclamation of the property, um, and that amount would probably be more um, appropriate to be set by the city engineer versus the special permit granting authority. And this is typically how bonds are handled in such as regards to construction of subdivision roads and things like that, that the, for instance, the planning board doesn't know 
what an appropriate bond is to ensure that a road is completed satisfactory. And the planning board typically relies on the, the city engineer in the engineering department to determine A, what's the appropriate amount and B, also to release the bond to say that this is completed uh, satisfactory. So um, that change would be consistent with how we act in other similar uh, circumstances. For performance bonds for other projects, um, is it the planning board or is it the city engineer or is it, are we only considering the city engineer uh, as the only here um, because it's only earth? Um, so for, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, Ms. Karen and Mr. O'Hara, but I, typically the board of, or the planning board would approve them, but it's approving what the city engineer recommends. Is that a correct characterization? Yes, so from Mr. O'Hara, we have uh, DPW engineering provides the numbers, then the planning board inserts as a condition of approval. So is this, so don't we want that to be maintained consistency here? Don't we want the planning board to approve the performance bond in an amount as determined by the um, DPW commissioner? Is that the wording that we're changing? Um, yeah, we, we could refine it to, to reflect that, that the, Planning board would still approve that amount, but it's you know determined based on number, I don't know, input or recommendation of the city engineer. Yes, I think that's fine. Reasonable condition for the uses allowed in the zoning district in which the land is located. Which one's that? Three point seven point two. So what that is, is um, inconsistent with uh, other sections. Council Zarella is proposing to delete the purpose statement to really get to the nuts and bolts of what is expected or required or permitted. But at the end of the, pur the purpose statement, there is a sentence that he thought was um, pretty important about the reclamation and restoration of the, of the property. And basically it just moves that intent down to the restoration section and just clarifies that a little. Um, so that it's not just governed by a mathematical slope formula, but that the restoration returns the land to a usable format for what would be expected or allowed in that area. Following the expiration of the trial with permit or upon voluntary cessation of operation or upon completion of removal in a substantial area, that entire area shall be restored. Uh, to reasonable condition for the uses allowed in the zoning district for which the land is located. Yep, sounds reasonable. Good, thank you. And some of the additional items where there weren't specific recommendations, um, but was, you know, areas that we should talk about or, or highlight is um, the DPW engineering, um, it would be helpful to have them develop specific standards that would be suitable for the city. And it may not be something that has to be in the zoning ordinance, um, or it could be you know, just a, a available um, expectations or, or something, but just to have a, a common understanding about how we govern these. Um, and also- And I do have comments from DPW Engineering. Okay. Um, if that's helpful. Um, okay. So for three, two or three, seven, two, one, um, you know, basically a statement wanted to be added to say plans should include provisions for construction phase and post construction stormwater management and indicate temporary and permanent slope stabilization measures that will be used. I'm going to go through all of them. Um, and then in three, seven, three, two, um, it was suggested that one foot vertical rise to one and one half foot is too steep and it should be to two feet. Yes, I agree with that. And 3733 may want to include or protected resource areas at the end of the sentence. So it would read provision shall be made for safe drink. drink 
drainage of water and for prevention of wind or water erosion carrying material onto adjoining properties or protective resource areas. Um, and and that's that's really the bulk of, of the changes requested by DPW. Thank you. And the, for what it's worth, the one concern that was stated that really, I don't know how the zoning ordinance could solve for it, but how do we solve for the fact that a lot of these areas where we have earth removal, the roads can't withstand heavy truck traffic. Um, and, and that was a concern that was flagged, but not necessarily as a condition to be added here. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, so what I would propose is we could maybe take these, um, all of these edits in, in one motion, uh, unless anyone has any objection, any specific ones. But I would like to make a motion to- Motion. To amend. Second. Okay. And this includes DPW suggested edits as well as Council Zarell's edits. Yes. And uh, is anyone in opposition? All right, so okay. So then, the next district. Um, now, uh, sorry to interrupt, Tom, but uh, if, if we have a shorter one, that would be good because we do have to adjourn at approximately six fifty for a special council meeting. Um, so to, that we're hoping to get out of the way before the legislative affairs meeting. Right. And we'll, we can continue up the rest of the items tomorrow night. So if we have a shorter one, maybe yep. site plan review, is that? Yep, so that's... site plan review capabilities. Um, it explains the planning board's site plan review capabilities to include three family developments, non-exempt container farming, timber harvesting, um, contractors yards and related uses and drive-throughs. Um, they had, the planning board also had suggested adding um, earth removal, but suggested that if the earth removal authority was handed back to the planning board to basically strike that. Um, so that that's their recommendation. I'll go ahead and pull it up now so you can see how it's reflected. Is that to keep keep it in if it was changed to the earth removal ordinance does not pass keep it oh i see yeah since it's since it's still with the planning board it still would trigger site plan. it's under the it's site plan and planning board so it's and well, right it should be fine just to stay so the things in red are the things we are expanding it, correct. And 181952 is more of just an encompassing. If there's anywhere else in the ordinance that's, that says site plan review is required, but it's not here, it's it's kind of a cover to, to ensure that this allows for that. Um, but, you know, the big thing is three family uses. That was a request from the building commissioner. Um, and then we just added non-exempt container farming, but we should really be able to take a look at what those uh, projects might look like. And then contractors' yards, lumber yards, salvage yards, those are all things that um, you know we want to see and we have a demand for, but you want to have a sense of what the site's going to look like. Um, I, and I did have a, as well. I did have a couple of changes proposed by Councilor Zarella. Um, the most substantial of which is to strike uh, municipal from 181.9511 and 181.9512. Um, so what that would be is, for instance, the development of uh, the new city hall would not require site plan removal or approval. I have a comment about that proposal. Sure, Ms. Karen. Um, I think it'd be nice to keep the municipal there because it provides a public hearing process for the public for public projects, especially like the school um parking lots municipal lots things of that you know aside from you know city hall which is already done 
but it's transparent and provides the public opportunity as well. So I think it's important to retain that. I would agree. I, I think that is an important consideration. Um, we have a comment from Mr. O'Hara that um, uh, questioning whether these municipal uses should be exempt that city, several city owned parcels have gone through site plan reviews such as the city hall campus, the Oliver Street parking lot, which is in development. Um, and then it's this feeling that the the plans got better each time we were able to review and talk about things and get input. And I think that's a legitimate um, critique that maybe we should keep this in, that it's, we don't want to restrict what the city can do, but there is value to having a forum for things to be discussed. I agree, I'm opposed to removing municipal. Same. All right, so it sounds like we'll uh, abandon that. Um, proposed edit and is that going to be it then do we i guess i could i could set the table for for tomorrow um and if anyone you know if you could review the materials let me know in advance if you have any feedback i'm happy to talk through things adaptive industrial district um replaces the mill conversion overlay properties that are in this district can either retain industrial rights or they can gain added flexibility through a special permit from the planning board, uh, the commercial recreation um, district. I think, I'm sorry, uh, Tom, sorry to interrupt. Can we go back to site plan review just real quick? Mm -hmm. I think there was one additional um, change proposed by Councilor Zavala. I think we should, um, it involves 181.9513. 19513, exemptions. One, three. Um, so I think it's just a formatting thing that he's proposing. So it would be to delete 181.9513. And, and just renumber it as an exemption. You can set the text thereof as 181.952 exemption. Oh, so I think it's just a formatting thing about having it be its own distinct group rather than within the larger list. Does anybody have any opposition to that? No, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I think it's not substantial, it's just formatting. Okay, sorry to interrupt, Tom. Please no, go back. No, it's quite all right. Um, commercial Recreation District would be proposed for the parcels off of Game On Way and at Great Wolf Lodge, and this would basically be to encourage tourism, uh, regional tourism. Um, and then, you know, from there, we would look at the dimensional table that basically regulates the character of development in each district. Um, the use table, um, which essentially says what can take place where, and then the map. Um, the last item, deletion of overlay districts, is really a formality once we review the map. I, and I want to let everyone see this because I think it would be useful for the committee to have a, a look at the zoning map changes before tomorrow's meeting. Um, you can access the changes through uh, this the city's tax map, which is accessgis.com. Um, I'm going to pull it up as we're speaking here. Accessgis.com forward slash Fitchburg MA. Yeah, I don't think you need to put it in, but access A C C E S S G I S A X I S G I S dot com forward oh. slash Fitchburg M A. And then if you go into this is our tax map. Um, if you go into the layers section, you can have our zoning map, which is our existing map. And clicking here, you can see what all the districts are. Um, that's our existing map today. Um, then by unclicking that and clicking proposed zoning map, you could take a look at what is proposed. Um, and it, it'll generally, it takes a minute or two to kind of reload. Um, and so when, when it loads up, what you're actually able to do is go through and look on a pretty detailed parcel by parcel basis, every property that's in or out of a district. Um, and, the technology never works when it's supposed to as I'm presenting it to people, but you can click here and 
switch to imagery, which is basically a satellite view in the background. So you can actually see what the properties look like. So it's not just an abstract map. Um, if you want to switch it back, you can just go back to streets. Um, and then you can actually click on this I button and identify individual parcels on the map and get more information on what the address is, what the property owner is, what the size of the parcel is, all of that. Um, so as we're making these decisions, you can really tie it to um, the individual kind of parcels in question. And then from that, I had sent the, the council a, um, a list of track changes, sort of planning board recommendations to the map. Um, and I can, it might take me a second to pull up and it, it was included in the links to, to the board. Um, I don't know if you want to give me a minute or if, if you've got to go to this next committee meeting, I'll really defer to you all on this one. Is that the council committee's bundle three clean? Um, included in, uh, in the package were actually two links. One link was to access GIS forward slash Fitchburg MA. And then the second link was a, um, what's called, it, it was a, it was a link to the planning board recommendations. And it sounds like, some of you did not see it, so I'm actually going to go through and. Um, oh, yeah. it's at the email in the bottom. Proposed zoning map. Yes, Correct. it's within within the body of the email I forwarded from Tom. So, in that case, I will actually I'll pull it up just so you all can see how it operates. I think it would be um, appropriate for you to take a look. You also see the planning board's map recommendations. Okay because it's gonna look very confusing at first glance, but I think it's really useful um, to see what their recommendations are, just like we do track changes on a Word document. Um, oh. So again, I'd ask you to be patient as it's loading up, it takes time. Sometimes you gotta kind of move the map around a little bit. Um, okay, and especially, so yep. Notre Dame should be NBD, add to DBD. Oh, okay. okay, so you're seeing the changes. Mine's still loading. Um, yeah, but what you'll see are big blue letters throughout the map, and those big blue letters cover the planning board's changes. And the more you zoom in, the more legible those blue letters become. And I, I'm guessing by the time we sign off at today's meeting, it will load up and you'll see uh, what, what I'm trying to get to. And it, it might just be taking a while because I'm on video here. Um, but the link that I've given goes to that document with all the track changes, and we'd certainly have that up for review tomorrow uh, at our meeting. This is awesome. And that's that's it for me for now. We're going to adjourn this meeting, and then we'll take up uh, economic development tomorrow where we left off. Yep. So we're going to adjourn this meeting. We're going to have a a short um, special city council meeting and then legislative affairs is going to discuss the same items we discussed here. And tomorrow evening at the same time, we will meet again to take up the rest of the items and legislative affairs will meet after us again. Okay, great. Okay, oh, adjourn. All right, do I have a second? Second. All right. Thank you very much for your patience and thank for everyone. Thank you for everyone's hard work and input. And this is uh, great. And I'm glad to we'll loaded. Forward. Thank yeah, it, it is finally up. Yeah. <laughs> now you can kind of see the changes. And you can...